Creativity in the Age of COVID with Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. It's the only program in which therapy and entertainment come together to show everyone not only how to cope in the age of COVID, but how to be creatively productive through it all. And now, Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. Hello, Judy. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Richard? I'm doing great. As you can see, we still have our old <laughs> opening credits because right. we are still waiting. Uh, like with everything else in this world, but everything's a little on hold right now. Uh -huh. But our new name is Creativity in an Ever-Changing World, which I love this new title. Me too. Uh, so we will have new credits, everything next week uh, or our next show. Uh, as we uh, go into this ever-changing world that we're in. Uh, but under the umbrella of Richard Skipper Celebrates, what are you celebrating today? What am I celebrating? Um, I'm celebrating having really good friends in town. Uh, and they'll be staying with us starting tomorrow. And uh, that's really exciting. It's real, you know, and then I have some other good friends coming in about another two weeks after that. So... That, that's the best thing of all, I think. Oh, that's great. Now I'm going to start with my random question for today, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen. And the question is, if you could compete in the Olympics, which sport would you choose? I love that. Pickleball. <laughs> I have to tell you, can you explain pickleball to me? Because <laughs> I will say that just a, a few months ago, I had never heard of pickleball. Right. And my neighbor plays pickleball. And now Everywhere I go, I hear a pickleball. Is this a new craze? Is this something that just started? Well, it actually isn't. It isn't new in terms of being a sport. It's been around for, I think, around 15 years, actually. It's new to us, all right? Um, I, I started playing last year, and I've only played probably, I don't know, eight or ten times total so far. Um, but it's... You, it's a wonderful game because you, because any anyone of any age basically can play it. It's about the court is about a fourth of the size of a tennis court, so it's a lot smaller to get around in. So it's easier for those of us as we get a little bit older to move around in. Uh, and the, and the sport itself is sort of a combination, if you can visualize it, of tennis, ping pong, and badminton. Wow. Okay. It's well. Lots of fun. Yeah, well, I, I'm telling you, I, I had never heard about it. And then all of a sudden, it's like every time I turn around, right. everyone's playing pickleball. Right. Now, is there a is there a, a competition in the Olympics of pickleball? Not in the Olympics yet, but there is the the international pickleball competitions. Um, and they are they are based here in Naples, Florida, where I am. And you know, I mean, this is like a major event here now. <laughs> well, I I want to jump into our show today because we have three amazing people. And I want to tell you, I have been uh, in the rabbit hole today because I have been researching and studying them. First of all, uh, Doug DeVita, uh, I have known personally for a long, long time. He is an amazing playwright. I will actually bring him on camera uh, while I talk about him for a moment, uh, because uh, Doug and I, uh, Doug has interviewed me. Uh, we have, he's been uh, in the audience of my shows. I have been in the audience of shows that he's won. He has been in promotions of Ken Davenport, who is one of my favorite producers. Uh, he is an amazing uh, playwright. Uh, we also have uh, Joseph Lento, who I'm going to be bringing on in a few moments, uh, and uh, Tanya Pinkins, who is in the wings. Uh, Tanya, we're going to actually be giving away one of her books today uh, to a lucky winner at the end of the show. Uh, I pulled the, a word today, and the word that I pulled is faith. And we're not getting religious unless you want to get religious. Uh, but I pulled this word because faith gets us through a lot. And we've been through a lot in the past year, last two years. And Doug, first of all, welcome to the show. And Thank I want you. to ask you, in the midst of everything that we've gone through, what has kept you going through the last two years? And I know you've gone through some emotional moments as well, because you and I have 
been in touch and uh, mm-hmm. losses and, you know, the ups and downs of life. Uh, but what keeps you going as far as your artistic endeavors are concerned? Well, you know, the, for me, the pandemic has, has not, it's not been great, but I'm an indoor boy. So, and I write, I'm a writer. So in that respect, it has not changed all that much what I do. Um, but I think what has kept me going is that because I've had to be so focused, I don't have going out to eat. I don't have going to, not that I like not going to the theater, but I don't have going to the theater or the movies to distract me. I don't have shopping to distract me. Um, I've been more focused on moving forward. So in that respect, it's been a good thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and yeah, I did have that big loss back in December when my dog died, which was horrifying and, and unexpected. And um, it, uh, it stopped me. It stopped me for a month at, at the very least at the month. But, you know, you, you move on, you grieve, yeah. you process it. And Well, I want to go back to uh, two years ago, March 12th. That's when everything shut down for us here in New York City. Everything came to a screeching halt. Uh, Where were you in terms of your creative process? And how did you deal with, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Fable, uh, which is your uh, collaboration, if I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, Doug has created this amazing piece, which brings... uh, and correct me if I'm wrong in terms of describing this, um, the ghost of uh, Gypsy, uh, Gypsy Rose Lee, the, uh, the real Gypsy Rose Lee, and the myth of the show itself and the legend that surrounds this. He's brought these layers that we've known uh, together into an evening of theater and these different layers that have been placed upon these ladies uh, in and put them on stage. Uh, I don't know if I put that out there right. Have I? <laughs> Close. <laughs> it's almost. It, it, it's actually, it's, 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 a, it's called Fable, a fable about a musical fable. And what it is, it's, it's, it all takes place in the mind of the 97-year-old June Havoc uh, around the time of I'm just going to say it this way, a revival of the show. And um, she was always ambivalent about that show. And um, I remember I actually spoke to her on the phone. Um, I was working at Abingdon Theatre Company at the time. She was one of the founding members of the, of, the, of the company. And she would call. And, you know, we just all answered the phone. And I would sometimes pick up and it would be her. And she happened to call on the day that, that a revival was opening. And she was in a mood. Oh, she was in a, she was, she was going to talk to whoever picked up the phone and she was uh, not happy. And, and, you know, it really hit me for the first time what that show meant to her and not always in a positive light. So the idea sat with me for a long time and I had a lot of false starts. Um, I think I'd actually gotten through a first draft by the time uh, the pandemic started, Um, but I really had the time to work on it and polish it. So, so basically it's all filtered through her memory. She's an unreliable narrator. So I was free to make things up, which I did, mm-hmm. uh, which would probably not make her very happy either, but she comes off in a much better light. But yes, Ethel Merman is in it. Uh, 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 Arthur Lawrence, Jerry Robbins, her mother, Rose, Gypsy, um, there, and, and, a, and a, a baby June, a child who doesn't speak, but performs. Um, and it's, it's, um, it got published. It got, I was very, very happy to get an offer from Next Stage Publishing. Um, Gene Cato has this new uh, publishing house, Next Stage Press, and um, he's going gangbusters. He's really, I mean, he's he's positioning and moving into being a real competitive theatrical publishing house. Uh, and so I was thrilled. He's actually, I can't talk too much about it, but he's picked up three more of my titles. Um, one... One is being published next week, April 1st, and the other two, one in July, one in, in October. Um, so, so yeah, Fable was pretty much alive by the time COVID started, but I did use the time to polish it and work on it and um, get it to the point where it, it, um, where it is now. And there, there is a reading coming up. 
I can't say much more than that. Uh, but there is a, a, an industry reading coming up in, in late May. Um, I have a director attached, Richard Sabellico, who um, has a long history with Gypsy. He was in the Lansbury production, and he assisted Arthur Lawrence on the Tyne Daly production. And he's and directed worked, to me. <laughs> he, and, yes, yes. I've worked yeah. with him, yes. Yes. And yes. Um, so we've had, we've had some meetings. Um, we've had some uh, interested, spirited discussions about the script. Um, and and um, the one thing I can say about it, because this this has been talked about, um, we do have Lane Bradbury, who was the original Dainty June in 1959. She's going to be playing the 97-year-old June in this reading. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah, now, Lane is not 97, and she would kill me if, if anyone thought she no, was. No, yeah, she sure will. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, right, so I want right. to bring you know. I also want to bring Joseph Lento on right now, mm -hmm. and the amazing work that he is doing uh, as far as music and education is concerned. And I do want to mention that as we are wrapping up this month right now, uh, this is Cabaret Month, and this is also Music in Education Month. So it is absolutely appropriate that you join us today, Joseph. So thank you for being here. And same question that I asked Doug. I want to ask what. Uh, how has faith gotten you through the last two years? And uh, if you can bring us full circle also and where you were in terms of uh, everything when uh, everything shut down on March 12th, uh, two years ago. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, uh, faith and, and more than faith was obligation. When you're an educator, you're always driven by the obligation you have to the students. So it's a, it's a, just a, it's, it's an inertia, it just continues to take you. So you don't really have much time to think about what you don't have, but more what you need to do. And, you know, as a professional musician myself, it's what do we have to do to make things happen? So I guess the, uh, you know, the uh, experience kind of kicks in and second nature. And I, um, I've been teaching at a high school in Yonkers and I was planning on retiring. Um, I wound up staying longer than I did. Um, intentionally. I, I did not want to leave the students at that moment. I wanted to go back and see if I could help pick up where we left off. Um, I was fortunate enough for one reason or another, people asked me to write some articles about um, COVID and how, you know, schools could get back into the swing of things. And I immediately began getting into writing and um, trying to share some ideas and realign my curriculum and my approach to what I was doing. So what uh, do you think, Joseph, I'm really curious. What, what do you think is the biggest lesson that you learned um, during the pandemic in terms of teaching and, and working with students? That's a great question. Um, the biggest thing that I learned was that I was able to um, adjust my methods. I, I think being, being a musician, uh, more creative, not necessarily locked into things. So it allowed me to think outside the box. And I learned in, during that time that my music background came into play more than the pedagogy you might see, you know, in a textbook or something. So that's, that's the, my music came out more in terms of being more creative with how I was approaching the students. Um, I do want to let you know we're, we are getting a little feedback from someone. So if any of you have another window or something open on your computer or something, that will cause us to get a little bit of feedback coming back. Um, I also want to bring our next guest on, uh, Tanya Pinkins. Uh, I am absolutely uh, in awe of you and uh, even more so. Uh, and uh, today uh, I, I've... Uh, this, I, I went on Medium and I listened, uh, I listened uh, to your uh, essay that you wrote uh, because I had the opportunity to listen to it. How do you do that? Uh, I'm sorry? How do you listen to it? Because there was an actor, I don't know if it was an actor or just a gentleman, who, it's, it gave me the option of listening to it rather than reading it. And I sat and I listened to it. Are you aware of this? I'm going to send you the link. <laughs> there is someone who actually read it and, uh, you know, with uh, not giving a lot of emotion, but just actually reading 
um, and uh, you know about what we've gone through in the theater uh, with uh, since uh, George Floyd's uh, uh, you know un, uh, I mean in horrible murder and everything and how the theater reacted and everything. Um, and God bless you for speaking out and living your truth and being out there. But obviously the theater has gone through this major change, uh, but you were speaking out long before any of this was happening. Uh, and you have really been out there speaking. So uh, now the word faith uh, resonates, I think, louder than ever. And with what we've been going through, listening to the hearings as well, re hearing your words today and what we've been listening to with the hearings and everything have also been resonating very loud and clear to me. So I want to say thank you. Well, thank you for having me and a pleasure to meet you, Doug and Dr. Judy and Joseph. Thank you so much for having me. Nice you, 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 you were on two of my absolute all-time favorite television shows, Scandal and oh. Madam Secretary. So. Oh. <laughs> yes, I love those shows as well. <laughs> uh, can you kind of summarize for us from our audience? Uh, uh, Doug or Joseph, can either of you uh, mute yourselves for a moment because we are getting bad feedback. Sorry. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, I, I will take care of that. Sorry. Sorry. I can't find the... Okay. I got it. Okay, Tanya. Judy had a question, but I didn't hear it. Uh, let me unmute her. There we go. So Ta Tanya, can you, can you summarize for our whole audience um, your uh, your speech about why you're fed up with performative activism? Um, if I were to sum it up, and it's 26 mm -hmm. pages long, right. my summary for it is that I don't, I have not heard or seen a vision for a theater that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone has the right to want what they want, but when a vision comes forth that everybody's excited about, I believe an unlimited amount of energy will be made to bring that vision into manifestation. Right now, I just see people trying to stop feeling uncomfortable. And what if I do this? Will that make you all stop complaining? How do I stop the complaining? How do I stop feeling uncomfortable rather than sitting in the discomfort until it brings forth a vision that people can all work towards? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, last night um, I interviewed uh, an actor who uh, is appearing on a show now who is playing a character from the 70s who used a derogatory term uh, a homophobic slur, if you will. Uh, and he's been getting hate mail mm. uh, because uh, of his character uh, using this term. And uh, he was do he did uh, because the, the show is the winning time uh, on HBO, which is brilliant, by the way, um, and really uh, evokes that era so perfectly. And uh, I wasn't aware of uh, the backlash that he was experiencing from this. We didn't talk about that during the show last night. This was a conversation that we had after the fact. Uh, but he uh, has been getting this horrible uh, hate mail uh, because of the character he's playing. Uh, and, uh, but he's playing a historical character who did say those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, I would love, you know, your take, especially on this idea now that we are, have to revise or to tone down the rhetoric of these historical moments in our history. Uh, and we've got a, a play right here as well that I'd love to uh, hear his take on this as well. Well, I, for my for my part, I don't believe in censoring people's speech. 
I would fight for anybody's right to say any words they want to say. Now, your words might keep you from getting a job that gives you power over people, but I want people to be able to say what they say. And in terms of complaints and uh, harassing an actor, you know, I, I feel empathy for that actor. My first thought goes to these are bots. This is um, it certainly I, I wouldn't believe it was homosexual people, because if we don't let people hear the words, then they can't possibly know what actually happened. So to me, that sounds like people who are performing outrage about something about which they know nothing about just to start trouble. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree with that. Uh, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Doug. Uh, and Doug, do you want to weigh in on this as a playwright? Uh, absolutely, because it's it's a timely question. I, I, you've, Richard has seen my play, Philly's Trilogy, um, which is a, a play about a, a gay teenager growing up. We see him from the age of 12 through uh, almost 50. Two thirds of the play take place in the 70s. And I've been revising it. I've been I've been working on it because nothing is ever finished. Um, and I brought it. I brought pages into uh, one of my writing groups a week or two ago. And it's a broad range of people in the group. And you know, this the scene in particular was with teenage boys and one teenage girl. And there's a lot of slurs going on. I mean, Philly is being called everything you can imagine that kids said to each other in the 70s. And this one younger writer was, she, she, her head exploded. She was offended, she was disturbed. You can't say things like that. It's a horrible thing to say that. And yeah, I'm old now and, and I'm looking back on it and I'm thinking, but you can't erase the history of it. This right. is what was said in 1974. This is what was said to me in 1974. Mm. And I'm sorry if it disturbs you, but if I, you know, say, you know, say, oh, Philly, look at him. He's, you know, he tiptoes. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. want to make the point. And, and I, I actually, Tanya, everything you said, I, I don't know if you saw me nodding here. I was so in agreement. Um, and I love the idea of finding the vision. That's that's just that's going to be my new motto. I'm going to hang on to that. Thank you for that. I love that. I heard. Well, I, I, sorry. No, go ahead. I just wanted to say, like, I've also experienced this young people or just people being offended by what artists create. And it's like, well, if you're offended by what I've created, how do you feel about its actuality in the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is being uh, beating up on the artist for 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 showing you the world um, is is an easy it's that's an easy fight to pick rather than actually doing something about something that's in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, um, can you tell us a little bit about red pills? Uh, I. Uh, spend a little time on your website today for red pills. You haven't uh, seen the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet uh, because it's I would, I just became aware of it. Uh, and the game is quite, uh, uh, it's startling to say the least. <laughs> There's definitely some language and offensive stuff inside of there. Uh, well, it takes you to, it takes you on a journey. Let's just say that. It does. Um, so I, I went on this journey and I, you know, and I'm filling things out and I'm going, uh, who's going to see this? Where, you know, where is this taking me? Uh, I said, is Tanya going to have a picture? You know, I, I didn't know where this was taking me. So I'm filling that out. And then I went to Amazon and again, I clicked on, there's a chapter of your book on Amazon, an audio chapter, which I listened to today as well. Um, uh, about the making of the film. So you have really chronicled uh, the whole process of making this film. And again, talking about faith and the difficulties of making the film and that the film almost didn't get made because of you really wanting to tell this story and how far you wanted to go with that story. Do you want to elaborate on this? And of course the book, uh, is somebody may win the book today. They've got the opportunity to win the book uh, at the end of the show. 
I, I feel like um, secrets are, you know, you're only as sick as your secrets. I think that's from, from AA. And so I've always been a person who just tells everything then nobody has anything over your head. And I'm almost like, if you're going to threaten me with something, then you need to do it. Because for me personally, living in fear is the worst thing in the world. Is it Shakespeare that said, you know, a, a fool dies, a, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a brave man only dies once. And so um, I tell all of my truths. I'm not saying it's all of the truth, but the truth of how I experienced one being aware of how the 2016 election was going to go and even how the 2020 election was going to go. And because I was treated with such contempt for being so certain that 45 would win, I don't ever say their name. Um, when I got my sense of how 2020 was going to go, I said, you know, I don't really want to be treated that way anymore. I'm going to just take it and make a piece of art out of it. And people will tell me that it's far-fetched. And then after it came out, people were like, did you write that after 2020? I'm like, no, I wrote that like almost two years before 2020 because I hang out with people who I don't necessarily agree with, people who I might adamantly disagree with, but it helps me stay in touch with the reality of the world. Right. I have a question regarding that. Uh, and by the way, Joseph, you uh, have muted yourself, so I can't unmute you. So yes, uh, <laughs> just to let you know, if you want to jump into the conversation. Um, uh, Tanya, when I was, uh, again, listening to this, uh, your you mentioned names, you know, uh, a, a particular director's name, for example, and you don't hold back. Um, and... Uh, you know, and a lot of times in this business, uh, a lot of people are afraid to speak their truth uh, for fear uh, of uh, repercussions in this business. And there are uh, going to be repercussions. Believe me, I, when I speak my truth, I'm like, there's consequences. I'm going to take them. Uh, I want to ask you, number one, where does that conviction and that courage come from? Because again, I love it. I uh, I ordered your book this morning, your self help book, because I said I want a little bit of that uh, for myself. <laughs> and you are you teaching workshops at this? Because it was uh, when I heard. I mean, your courage, just to, your honesty, is so refreshing, and we don't have enough of that in this business. It's true. And because I feel, you know, I spend a lot of time fighting about the sexual abuse that's happened to actors inside the unions, not just the acting union, the directing union. I fought so hard about it. It's a it's an area that, you know, I have personal experience with and I am rabid about it. And I ended up um, resigning from my position as an elected on the union because I saw that they were complicit and they were not going to do anything about it. Um, SAG, is that who you're, who you're I, I'm talking about equity. Equity, D, okay. SSDC. Um, I feel like as long as we keep those secrets, then those people get to keep doing that. And mm -hmm. we're actually protecting them. And not only are we protecting them, but um, one person that I interviewed said, when you protect you know, someone who's doing damage, you're also preventing someone who might do great good from getting an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody has a chance. It, it's just because someone was difficult for me, they might be great for someone else. Well, if I tell you the truth about them, you can decide for yourself. Well, that's not my experience of them. But when I don't tell you the truth, then if you have an experience, you're like, well, gee, was it just me? And then you, you're, you start to question yourself. And I think that that gaslighting, which goes throughout every business, is what allows people like Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, Woody Allen to, to get away for so many decades and for the people who finally come forward to not be believed. And that is causing harm to all of us. So for me, a vision has to include that we don't care how talented you are. If you are causing harm within the system, we're, we care about taking care of everybody, not about elevating one person to being, you know, the 1%. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, when I saw the documentary that was on HBO on Woody Allen, one of the things that really uh, got under my skin uh, was how complicit so many people in New York were because of the revenue that Woody Allen brought into New York City in, as far as the film industry was concerned. And because of the revenue that he brought into New York City, a lot of people turned a blind eye uh, to what was going on. People who knew what was going on, and uh, which is, you know, really shocking as well. And uh, that this goes on in every aspect of the industry. But, you know, when you were serving on, you know, and I know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alex Corey, uh, when she served on uh, Actors Equity, I mean, she was able to also make changes on the board because of injustices that she served, uh, that, what she dealt with uh, early on in her career um, that uh, she that she's talked freely about, uh, that she was able to make those changes. But within the system itself, uh, people on the board, I know of other people who have fought the board, uh, who, um, is it because they're holding on to their own power? Is it they're holding on to uh, their position that they're afraid to speak out. Um, it, Definitely all of that. I mean, I knew who my board members were and I knew that the board would not uh, support what I had in mind. So I took it to the membership, which meant I had to go find members in every region who would put forth this plan and proposal of how basically we were going to create, a, uh, we weren't going to create, we were going to employ a third party system that allowed people to uh, report sexual harassment, abuse of any kind in the workplace. And the beauty of this system, and it, it exists on some campuses, is it's, um, it's encrypted and it is reported at the time of the event, but the person doesn't have to take an action at the time of the event. So it's a database that lasts beyond time. And the way the Callisto database works is if someone else reports someone who matches your abuser, you'll get a notification. Someone else has reported that abuser. Do you want to proceed to a further complaint? Would you like to connect with that person? Do you want to just continue to remain anonymous? But because we know these things happen forever, these people don't stop, even if they get older, this is a database has the potential to help everybody. Yeah, that's terrific. And, and in sitting, and, and so the union member, the members themselves voted overwhelmingly and unanimously in one of the regions that they wanted equity to implement and fund. Right. It would have cost about $15 per member. And what happened is the board did a whole smear campaign about it and gave the um, members uh, a committee to discuss sexual harassment. And uh, they got another committee. And this system didn't get implemented and, and it still goes on. And I don't know right. if you all know that, you know, nobody even talks about the men and the article that was supposed to be written about the men and all the directors and what they've done to the men. You know, there was a threat to shut down the New York Times and the L.A. Times if that article even got written. So we know these people are being protected. And I just don't think that anybody's so talented that they get to the right to destroy other people. Absolutely mm. not. Absolutely not. I, I, it's very courageous that you did that. And I, you know, commend you for, for taking a really hard stand and, you know, quitting when, when they when they undermined exactly what you were trying to do. I mean, that's it's, it's a tough, a tough stance to take. And then you should really be applauded for that. So something harkening back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier. Um, I heard a really good debate on NPR the other day uh, about, I, I think it's about the Emmett Till play. Is there a new Emmett Till play that's out? Um, and the, the, the it, well, although maybe it was referring to- There's the an show. opera, I think, that was at SUNY. An that opera, I, about. I, have, I didn't read about it, but an opera. Right. The gist of the argument was whether Things like that are too cathartic for the audience. 
okay? And that instead of the people just feel like they've done something by going to see a, a play mm. um, that, you know, that they can empathize with and really, you know, feel uh, for, for the characters and, you know, that, 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 that for them, that's enough. Instead of becoming activists around the, the subjects that are being brought up and actually doing something concrete. Uh, you know, do we get lulled into a sense of complacency with some of this? So I'm curious as to everybody's thoughts on that. I'd like to hear from the playwrights. Hmm. Doug, why don't you start then? Um, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, because that, that's a big question and that's the kind of thing that would, you know, could take me a while to really figure out. Um, I, I know for me personally, I don't just, if something gets me riled up, I don't just think about it. I do things. I mean, I do, I, I, I will, I will, I will get out there and I will, cause I talk a lot as I think, you know, and, <laughs> and I will talk to people and I will, I will spout my opinions. And as I learn more, I mean, I don't like to talk if I don't know the, whole thing and both sides of it. And I definitely don't like to talk if I haven't seen something, which I also find to be rampant these days. Um, as for the Emmett Till project, I think it was done at John Jay is, is where it was done or is being done. And um, I think there, there's not just the fact that people are sitting back and, and not um, to just being let it wash over and not taking action. I think there's also some some uh, pushback because of who the authors are and how dare they take this story and make it their own. Um, which, that's a whole other discussion. But in terms of me, I mean, I, I, I have been known, and I'm not going to get political, Richard, I, prob I promise, but I've been known to go on big rants on, on all social media when, I'm, when I am angry about something. And I know that's not enough. Um, if I can but, jump in, Jennifer, excuse me, but some people do think that's enough. You know, with all okay. due respect, you know, that they think that if they go on Facebook or uh, Twitter, that they've done it, that that's enough. And it's not. No, it's not, no, it's not enough. I don't think it's enough, but I do do it. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Because I have engaged with some really hardcore, you know, right wing fascists on social media. I mean, it gets ugly. It gets so ugly that then I have to go off for a while. <laughs> it's like, woo, you start fearing for your life and you feel completely slimed. My husband um, loves doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I got banned from Twitter for 24 hours because of something I said to uh, McC uh, Mitch McConnell. Oh, good for you. What? <laughs> I told him to drop dead. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Um, may I? Um, no, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, Joseph, jump in, please. You've been quiet. No, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. And, um, and um, I, I actually find myself um, in, in a really good place. Um, I'm also teaching a course in uh, developmental psychology and all deference to Dr. Bloom. I'm not a psychologist, but as a school district administrator, you know, I know all the educational stuff. Right. And the school I'm in is really fantastic. And it's more of a course in neurodiversity and critical thinking. And as a matter of fact, the, the young ladies in my class, we're working, just started on developing social issues the same way I taught them how to conduct an experiment they're coming up with five or six critical social issues that they're putting into a hypothesis, and then they have to prove what they're doing. So as I'm hearing all this, I'm saying, you know, I'm blessed to have an opportunity to give people, young people, the skills they need to try and address their concerns in a Socratic, critical thinking way. And as an educator, I'm completely neutral. They only know that I like the Yankees um, over huh. the months. And so as I'm listening, I'm saying, you know, I'm really very blessed to be in a position to try and do something to give young people the skills to articulate what they need to do to push their agenda forward in a critical, um, sensitive, thoughtful, academic way. 
Um, and I just happened to have shared an article with them that I wrote about ending the um, pre, uh, uh, pipeline from schools to prisons, you know, using music. And we went over it. And while I'm so passionate about it, I cited data. I, there was no hyperbole involved. There was no what I think, no what I did, where I came from, how it helps. No one cares what I think. I don't even care what I think. Um, but it's important to show our young people we can disagree, but if we want to do it, let's do it using facts. And then if we can't agree on that, that we should not be cruel to each other. So I'm really in a very, very good position. Um, and I hear all this painful dialogue. It's uh, it's troubling, but I'm very blessed to be in a place where I hopefully am doing something to help prevent these things in the future. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's reminiscent of what's going on in a lot of college campuses where, you know, people are, are silenced from talking, you know, and that doesn't make any sense. It's supposed to be a place where mm -hmm. it happens, where you hear all sides of, of an issue and you understand that different people have different points of view and that's okay. You don't have to agree with them. Right. But you know, like Tanya was saying before, they have the right to say what they're going to say. Um, it doesn't mean I have to agree with you and I can argue, you know, strongly against mm -hmm. what you're saying. And that's okay, too. Yeah, yeah I, I, I told the young ladies only this morning, I said, you may have the most wonderful outcome. You've proved everything and someone will still disagree with you. There's nothing you can do about that. Just we don't have to harm each other over it. Yeah, and we don't have to d decide that, you know, anybody's deprivation, oppression is the worst of all. Like, you can be oppressed, and I can be oppressed, and you can be oppressed in four different ways, and I can be oppressed in three different ways. And I see so much of this. Um, it's not a contest. Yes. It becomes a contest, and anybody who says, well, wait a minute, you're not the only one, can get canceled, can get attacked. And I'm one of those people who's like, I'm, you're going to have to attack me because I'm not going to let your abuse be the number one abuse in the world. Nobody can hold that position. That's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I, I think a lot of young people also carry a lot of burden with them and they're not sure why. And they're not sure what they're carrying. You know, um, so you know, you're bringing that out. Who feels worse than someone else? Always try to get, at least for me, get my students to focus on the positive things. What's positive? We all have a story. We can respect each other. Let's help get forward. Let's move each other forward. Otherwise, there's no hope. Tanya, I have a question for you. You talked earlier about, uh, you know, where we are with the theaters and everything. Do you have any idea of how, I mean, this idea of everyone in the theater is trying right now uh, to be, quote unquote, woke? And uh, uh, yeah, do you have an idea? And then, Doug, I'd like to get your thought on this as well. Uh, how we navigate these waters, especially now, um, you know, because to me, the theater is about experiencing the human condition. And I think that we are, it's like a whole new generation is coming along that is forgetting that, uh, forgetting that we are not talking about the human condition, but you have to actually, if you haven't experienced that part of the human condition, you have no business being on stage portraying that aspect of the human condition. Um, your thoughts, Tanya, and then Doug, and then I want to do a, a little fun round table type, uh, you know, type of a, a little thing to wrap up today. Uh, so Tanya, you first, please. I just think we all have to get very comfortable being uncomfortable. When we can get uncomfortable together from that place, that's where the vision will come from. That we're all sitting here uncomfortable together. And anytime someone's trying to, I don't want to offend you. And I don't want to, we, 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 we're not all vulnerable in the same way. We've got to be vulnerable together and it's going to hurt and it's going to be shameful. And that's what we make the theater out of all of those beautiful things. I saw this um, Cherokee, it wasn't Cherokee actually, it was an indigenous. And it said, 
sometimes when you can't find a solution, you've come upon a truth that needs to be accepted and sat with. Wow. 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 Are you all there? Can I, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Yes. So, yes. Yes. To wrap up, I, you know, this is my homage to James Lipton inside the actor's studio. Uh, this show is creativity in an ever changing world. So I've got some random questions that I'm going to throw at each of you today. Uh, and I'll start with you, Doug. And the first question is, um, going through the past two years and the work that you've done, uh, when did you have the strongest self-confidence in terms of the work and the art that you're creating? Yesterday. <laughs> Good for you. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, it's been growing. It's it's actually it's it's. I'm going to do a little plug for for Ken Davenport as well here. Um, I, I've joined his next stage group, and it it has done wonders for me and my self confidence. And um, can today, can you, get him, can you get him here? I want him on this panel. I'll ask him. I'll ask yes. him. I think he may be watching. Who knows? He, he, he may. I love know. Ken Davenport. I do too. He's he's been very very supportive of me. And today he posted a question on on Facebook that said. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle you've overcome in the last two years? And that's when I realized I've kind of stopped, you know, believing in imposter syndrome. So that's why I, so you, your question today is similar to one I answered this morning. And it's, it's, it's that. Great. Uh, Joseph, um, for you, what is the hardest decision that you've had to make in the last few years when it comes to your creativity? I, I have to say, I really haven't. I don't really think in terms of those things. The way I operate is if I, if I place a burden on myself, I become immobile. So I really have not placed any boundaries on myself. Good for you. I the thought of myself as being a prisoner to anything that was going on. Um, and that, that, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I don't, so I don't have an answer for you other than I just do what I do because it needs to get done. I just hope I do it better as I get older. Yeah. If we can all hope for that. Uh, Tanya, how do you desire that others are seeing you at this point in your career? You've got her muted. Uh, uh no, I, I didn't mute you. Did I? No, I muted me. Okay. 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 Take the echo out. <sighs> There's two sides to that. There's the what is of it and the what if I was God of it. So if I was God, I wish that there was a space in the world for me, and not just me, for more of us to express all of our authentic creativity in all the ways in which we do. But what I believe will happen is that I will leave a huge body of work that will be discovered after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, she did all. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that, that you said that. Judy, do you want to elaborate on any of the comments that were just made? I, I think everybody is is here is very self aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Doug, as far as other work art that you've seen in the past uh, year and a half, because everybody else has found new ways of presenting their art. Um, what has really moved you as far as maybe a Zoom presentation or different ways that people are presenting their art? Um, I'm trying to think. There was a Zoom thing that, that I saw, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. And it was by a playwright I do not know, but I decided what the hell I'm going to link and uh, click the link. Um, 
And damn, I, it was a while ago. It was, it was about two years ago. Um, and I cannot remember the name of it or the author's name, but it really, really touched me. It was about, um, yeah, it was kind of about someone facing imposter syndrome. So of course that really hit hard with me, but it was a two person show and it, um, it was perfect for Zoom. It was about a 45 minute presentation and it just really just hit every note that, that, that jazzes me, that frightens me and that engages me. And, and I will look back on my notes and things and see if I can remember who the hell wrote it and what the name of it was. And then I'll, I'll let you know and we can let everybody know somehow. Oh, great, let me know, I'll, I'll post yeah. it on YouTube. Um, and Joseph, I mean, you, you have already answered, you know, that you don't think in terms of, you know, getting down and everything. Same question with you, out of all the art that you've seen this year, maybe in new uh, ways of looking at art through uh, this medium, for example, what's really inspired you this year? Well, I, you know, um, when, as a brass instructor, um, I really thought it was going to be horrifying to not be able to be in person with my students. And what I automatically realized was that I actually had a vantage point now that I could see them face on. And I could be very specific about what was happening as opposed to a peripheral view. Now I'm really in front of them. So I actually found a, a rainbow in all this. And I actually have no, a Zoom for one-on-one -on -one brass instruction is fabulous. Um, so I found it to actually be helpful to my skills and helping my students. I, I um, I actually wrote something about it. So I was pleasantly surprised. I was scared to do it at first because you always want to do your best. But I was pleasantly surprised. I, I know that's not a usual answer, but that's how I experienced it. Good for you. That's wonderful. Um, Tanya, uh, people have, uh, I've read that a lot of people because of COVID everything have had a lot of recurring dreams uh, through COVID. Has there been a particular recurring dream that you've had over the last two years uh, that you've truly enjoyed? You're muted again. I'm muted. <laughs> no, I don't remember my dreams very often. And the pandemic was a very good time for me. It was just well, can I talk about something that's not a dream then that has okay. become a reality and that's red pills? Oh, well, you know, the one thing I wanted to say, going back to the question you asked Doug about people, you know, do they just get cathartic and then they just do nothing? When I make art and red pill is an example, I want to make people uncomfortable. You're not going to get the, oh, you're going to be like, I kind of like that. Why did she do that? I hated that. I want to make people be uncomfortable in themselves so that they have to do something to get comfortable again. I'm with you. Well, with that, with that statement, uh, are, are you saying essentially that everyone who sees this film is going to see themselves in the film? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're going to hate themselves and go, that's not me. Or it's been really funny the people who tell me, come and go, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Because I think I attack everybody in this film. Everybody does that. Wow. Uh, Doug, as far as your work is concerned, what is the biggest upset that you've experienced this past year and a half or two years? It, with your art? Um, I can't say that I've had one. I mean, uh, it, it's petty. It's like getting rejections from, you know, competitions, which are, which, you know, and they sting for like 20 minutes. You know, what's that, what's that line in, in, in the, the lyric? It stung a little, but not for long. Mm -hmm. the, you know, those are the biggest upsets for me. I mean, I've been very lucky. I've been very fortunate. Um, I've, I've worked very hard at just being able to focus on moving forward and letting go of the anger and rage and using whatever anger and rage is there to fuel the next project. Okay. And Joseph, uh, 
a TV series that or that you've really binged this past two years that you could watch over and over again? Um, no, I'm, I'm not necessarily a binge watcher, um, although I do love baseball. Uh, okay. That I listen to every day, radio or watch it. Um, I love the History Channel. I don't necessarily binge watch. Well, Monk is probably my favorite show, though. I will watch several episodes of Monk in the Road. Yeah. And uh, Tanya, what is the one thing that you've learned about yourself over the past two years that has surprised you the most about yourself? Um, I think that a lot of the thoughts and feelings that I have are thinking and feeling me. And the fact that I've been living outside of the country for a while has allowed me to see that because I know if I were in New York and feeling or thinking some of these things, I would be blaming them. And because I'm in a place that's kind of perfect, I'm like, oh, well, there's nothing to blame. Oh, well, is that yours or is that just coming into you from somewhere else? So it's got me questioning all of it and, and able to just be with it and not attach in a certain way. Wow, well, good. Well, we're gonna do a giveaway and I'm gonna show you how this works. I'm gonna bring this on here and we're going to, uh, the, this is how this works. And I'm gonna bring this on here and uh, we're going to draw this. Uh, let's see here, draw and, and someone's gonna win one of your books and they get to choose the one they want. And it's Pam Stubbs. So Pam, uh, reach out to me and uh, I will get you uh, the book of your choice. Uh, it could uh, be the book on uh, the filmmaking of uh, Red Pill or uh, the uh, motivational book. Uh, just reach out to me and uh, I will get that to you. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here today. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment uh, because we're gonna give each of you a chance to have your final word. Uh, I'm going to start with my final word. Um, as I said today, uh, the word is faith. Uh, may we all have the faith uh, to, like Tanya, uh, live our truth and to tell our stories and to get them out there and to get out there and live our lives to the fullest and to support each other and to celebrate each other. That's why I call myself Richard Skipper Celebrate. Uh, it's all about celebrating each other. Uh, and I do believe that there's something to celebrate in each other and everything. Uh, I'm the kind of person that if I'm, when I see something on Facebook, my belief is I like, I comment, and I share. And if I don't like it, I hide it and I move on uh, because there's too much dissension out there and I don't want to tear other artists down. I want to build them up. And that's why I do what I do. Uh, that's why Judy and I do what we do every other Thursday. And we're going to continue celebrating. Uh, I also end all of my shows by telling you we want to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list. And the fixed name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Because as my dear friend Sean Moniger says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So I'm going to leave the screen. And then I'm going to start with you, Doug. And then you, Joseph. And then you, Tanya. And then Judy, you will, as usual, have the final, uh, the last word. Uh, thank you all for being here. And if I can ever do anything for you, pick up the phone and call me. I'll talk to you later. And Doug, now you've got the screens. It's yours. Oh, I just want to, I want to thank you, Richard, for inviting me to be on this panel today. Um, and it was just really wonderful to, to be here with you, Judy and, and Tanya and Joseph. And I learned a lot today. And that's one of the things that I love doing every day. So this was for me, terrific. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you, Doug. Joseph. 
Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you, uh, Doug. It's been an honor being here. Um, just to be grateful and have gratitude. Pass along all the good that's been given to you. And um, always be grateful. Try to put a smile on people's face. It's, I think it's the right thing to do. Even when you're not feeling it yourself, try to be happy for others. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Tanya. Ah, you're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> there Thank we go. You. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Skipper. I needed this today. Uh, it was just very inspiring and I, I needed it. I was having a hard day. Um, I'm going to echo what Joseph said about gratitude. I think gratitude is the most powerful prayer in the world. When I think about the story of Jesus, the Christ multiplying the fishes and the loaves, it didn't say suddenly there were 40 fishes and 20 loaves. It says there was enough. And I think that that's what the prayer of gratitude is when we can be grateful and that gratitude for everything, even those things that we don't like to, to have the faith that everything that comes into our life is there to make us better at living our destiny. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity to spend time with you and, and please watch Red Pill and read the book and play the game. Yeah. It's going to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> we love being uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I want everyone to remember that life is not about expecting and hoping and wishing. It's about doing and being and becoming. And the place you're used to is not necessarily the place that you belong. So dare to do something that you find challenging. And then don't give up just course correct when it's needed. Eventually, you'll wind up where you need to be. Thanks for being with us.